The first point about him is land, native soil. Not land as a squeezed lot in a subdivision of trenchants, with mortgage as a more palatable name for rent, but land as mystique and thought of as mother in thousands of acres. Then comes family, not as a couple and a couple of kids, but family of hundreds of cousins and kin to the sixth generation. Finally, there's tragedy, the principled kind, predestined, it seems, beyond mortal control, the kind of tragedy we learn secondhand from Shakespeare and the Greeks, but which came to America as experience when he made his choice. In Virginia, it all took place in Virginia. That's how it was with Robert E. Lee. And here's where it started, in a place called Stratford Hall. American lifestyle. Stratford Hall and Robert E. Lee. Starring as your host, Mr. E.G. Marshall. Is brought to you by the U.S. F&G companies and 6,500 independent insurance agencies representing U.S. F&G. Is it any wonder that we're fascinated by the birthplaces of famous people? Beginning in nurseries like this one for Robert E. Lee at Stratford Hall, we have our best opportunity for warping time, for folding back the known facts and events of a great life into a dimension of the not yet known. By searching the first threads of Robert E. Lee's heritage and environment, we quicken the chance to understand the ultimate weave of the grand design we already know. Clearly, Robert E. Lee is a foreground figure in the tapestry of American history. Almost certainly, he was the greatest military mind the American civilization ever produced, and at the same time, one of its clearest candidates for sainthood. His goodness and strength of character did as much as his generalship to sustain and dignify the Southern cause. Here in what they call the Mother's Room, the drama and destiny of Lee's life began. He was born in this room on January 19, 1807. This is Robert E. Lee's original cradle. Think about the fate that was slumbering here. A man who one day plans a strategy that would kill 10,000 Yankees in a single hour and yet would blush if given a personal compliment. This bed is Sheraton and the wood is mahogany. The spread is tôle de jouy and the fabric of the canopy is the same. It's a 1790 pattern named America's Homage to France. It began in 1638 when the first Lee, Richard by name, who came to be called Richard the Emigrant, arrived in America from England. Eventually he got some acres because he married the ward of Virginia's governor. This river is the Potomac, virtually a Lee family artery. At one point in Lee history, there was an enormous wharf down here, serving ships which were built here and family owned. Lee ships sailed the Atlantic between here and England. In this new colony, tobacco was the money crop and, like cotton later, required immense tracts of land and lots of cheap labor for its successful cultivation. This fact inevitably gave rise to plantation life and, finally, to the large-scale importation of black slaves. This cabin at Stratford Hall is a relic of the slaving days and an echoing omen that the appointment between Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse was being made over 200 years before they met there. It's recorded that on that day of his surrender, Lee was immaculately groomed in a clean dress uniform set off by a red silk sash and parade saber. Grant, who apologized for his own disheveled appearance, came looking more like the vanquished than the victor. No one could doubt the internal agony Lee must have felt that day at Appomattox. Yet all witnesses report his almost perfect bearing and decorous behavior, which were lifetime traits. One of his distinguished relatives, Thomas Lee, built Stratford Hall 
and sired two great patriots, Richard Henry Lee and Francis Lightfoot Lee, both of whom signed the Declaration of Independence. Robert E. Lee spent only the first three years of his life here at Stratford Hall. But he owned spiritual title to this place and the lifestyle it represented. This is the view from the north side of the house, down to the Potomac, two miles away. The plantation had 1,400 acres when Stratford Hall was built between 1725 and 1730, and more were added later. It was named for a Lee ancestral home in England. This facade is a duplicate of the one on the opposite or south side where we began. The house is built on an H plan. It may be hard for you to see the H, but it's formed by the side wings, which are joined by the crossbar of the one room in the center section. Crowning the hip roof are eight chimneys in two groups of four, each cluster joined by arches. Goethe called architecture frozen music. I think Stratford Hall could be described as frozen geometry. They call this room the Great Hall. And in its day, that was no exaggeration. It was one of the grandest rooms on the North American continent. It's a perfect square, 28 feet, 6 inches along each wall. The flat walls are paneled, and all the doors and windows are flanked by fluted Corinthian pilasters. The chandelier is a classic example of the best of the colonial period. The settees, covered in crimson damask and fine needlepoint. The gilt-framed mirrors are Queen Anne. The 17th century armchairs have cane backs and scroll foot carving. The clock is of the William and Mary period. The spinet and harp are thought to have been brought from England. And we know for certain there was music here and dancing. Reels and minuets and splendid ladies in silks and brocades. I told you the Lees had a tradition of marrying well. In his own time, Robert commented on this by advising a friend, never marry unless you can do so into a family that will enable your children to be proud of both sides of the house. From that point of view, what could be better than marrying another Lee? That's how Robert's father came to be Squire Stratford Hall when he married his second cousin, Matilda Lee, who had inherited the plantation in her generation. Robert's father, Henry by name, but known to history as Light Horse Harry Lee, was from another branch of the Lee family, upriver, at a place called Lee Sylvania. A Princeton graduate, Light Horse Harry Lee, had been a daring and brilliant cavalry officer in the American Revolution. He had even devised the plan that entrapped Cornwallis at Yorktown, which forced the surrender of the British Army and secured American independence. We're in the Stratford Hall kitchen now, in a separate building, a few steps from the main house. The plantation, in its great and golden years, was almost totally self-sufficient, with its own cattle, sheep, pigs, and chickens, and all the various fruits and vegetables, like squash, cabbage, peas, beans, and grain crops of wheat and corn. There is some documentation of the time that the Lee Plantation consumed in a year, 27,000 pounds of pork, 20 sides of beef, 550 bushels of wheat, and thousands of ears of corn, four hogsheads of rum, and 150 gallons of brandy. Life, it would seem, was bountiful. When the servants carried the food from here to the main house, it was customary for them to have to whistle. This would prevent them from eating samples along the way. A hundred years of planting tobacco was exhausting the soil of Stratford Hall. And slowly, the great plantation was beginning to decline. And as brilliant as Robert's father had been in war, so were his efforts in peacetime disastrous. Though he did serve competently as a governor of Virginia and as a member of Congress, he repeatedly got involved in grandiose business and real estate ventures that always failed miserably. Also, after eight years of marriage and two surviving children, his first wife, Matilda, died in 1790. In 1793, Lighthorse Harry remarried. 
a girl 17 years his junior. She was Ann Carter of the powerful James River Carters and was destined to become the mother of Robert E. Lee. Beautiful and pampered by an upbringing of wealth and gentility, there seemed to be so little to prepare Anne for the hard and massive misfortunes she would endure in her lifetime. But this fragile and aristocratic beauty was made of human granite and became the single most influential molder of Robert E. Lee. Anne Carter Lee and Light Horse Harry were to have six children together. Robert was the fifth, and it is said was unwanted. Because of Harry's deepening financial woes, he even served a year in debtor's prison when Robert was two, the family had to leave Stratford Hall, which now passed on to Light Horse Harry's son from the first marriage, Robert's half-brother, Henry. This is the Stratford Hall stable, just west of the main house. And this elegant carriage is similar to one owned by the Lees. Robert's family left here by carriage and moved to a modest house in Alexandria, Virginia, where they maintained themselves on the income from Robert's mother's inheritance. All this, of course, was gone forever. At one time here, there had been scores of horses, and all the Lee men were superb riders, not the least of whom was Robert, who first rode here as a baby in the arms of his father. Robert E. Lee grew to manhood in Alexandria, a manhood that came early and in earnest. Light Horse Harry Lee had been almost fatally beaten by an unruly mob in Baltimore during the War of 1812, and having gone to Barbados in an attempt to regain his health, died on the return voyage. This tragic man, a spiritual and physical exile, was never renounced, however, by his wife, Anne, or by his son. They had adored him. She was a deeply religious woman. Her faith was a source of strength, which became the rock on which Robert's character was built. Still, Anne Carter was determined that her son would avoid the recklessness and ruin of his father's life. We're in the west wing now, the parlor. The magnificent tall clock in the corner is made of mahogany wood, and its maker's mark reads, John Johnson, London, 1740. The near tea table, carved with a scroll top, is a Sheraton, and the chairs are variously Sheraton and Heppelwhite. This splendid Sheraton secretary bookcase is one of the finest pieces in Stratford Hall, and was one of the original pieces belonging to Robert E. Lee, the mantel here is Adams style, and the portrait over it, painted by Charles Wilson Peale, is of Light Horse Harry's comrade in arms and old friend, the Marquis de Lafayette. Life seemed exquisitely good for Robert's father, but despite all the apparent advantages, Light Horse Harry was headed for terrible times, and these two would have enormous influence on Robert's life. These are the dining rooms. As you can see, there are two of them. This far room is called the small dining room and is used for casual meals and perhaps the younger children ate there. The lady in the life-size portrait is the English queen, Caroline. This larger room was reserved for more formal occasions. And the Lees, in their heyday, entertained lavishly. Ah, the table is now set, I see. Oyster stew, rock bass, perch, candied yams, fresh vegetables, blackberries with milk, topped off by a glass of Madeira wine. A typical fish feast dinner at Stratford Hall in the 18th century. Won't you join me? This kind of elegant living wasn't totally lost to Robert E. Lee. Despite the near poverty he and his mother lived in, she saw to it that Robert was exposed to the social graces by sending him on frequent visits to other family plantations. He was a welcome guest, especially if there were daughters in the household. He had a cheerful disposition, immense tact and sensitivity, and eventually became just about the handsomest young man in the whole state. This is Lee, 
several years following his graduation from West Point in the class of 1829. He was so handsome by that time that a classmate dubbed him a marble model. Lee finished second in his class and true to his character without a single demerit. When Stratford Hall was in its prime, the children were taught here by a Livian tutor. It's supposed that Robert E. Lee's education, however, began when his mother taught him to read and write. But his first formal schooling actually started at age seven. He was an excellent and diligent student and was particularly adept at mathematics and languages. But there was a truer discipline in these years for Robert E. Lee. Come with me and I'll tell you more. Lee's mother, crippled by arthritis, had become an invalid, and it fell on Robert to take care of her. They call this room the library. Everything he had been taught about selflessness, charity, and self-denial was hammered into pure moral metal in his unflagging devotion to being doctor, nurse, son, daughter, and constant companion to his nearly helpless mother. How can I live without Robert, she said, when he got his appointment to West Point. The carpet here in the library is a Jordis. The walnut desk bookcase is Queen Anne, and so is this easy chair, which is gold-colored mohair. The chandelier is a smaller version of the one in the Great Hall, and the design, typical of the period, was very popular. The Georgian period looking glass is one of the most valuable pieces in the room. Anne Carter Lee had accomplished much, despite enormous adversity. She was justifiably proud when Robert graduated with such distinction and came home a newly commissioned second lieutenant. She died less than a month later, safe in the belief that she had come through and that her job was finished. Lee mourned her loss deeply, but soon it was time for the other important woman in his life. This is Mary Ann Randolph Custis. She and Robert were distantly related and had known each other since childhood. In yet another splendid Lee alliance, Robert and Mary Custis were married in 1831. She was to bear him seven children in the first 14 years of their marriage and was to be his wife until his death for 39 years. Nowadays, they call this splendid example of Greek revival architecture Arlington House. It crowns the sloping hill of sleeping soldiers known as Arlington National Cemetery. Beyond the marble snow of stones and across the river, again the Potomac, lies the capital city of Washington, D.C., and ironically, the Lincoln Memorial. But in Lee's own time, the hill was meadow, and the house was known as the Arlington Mansion. Its master was George Washington Park Custis, grandson of Martha Washington, and adopted son of George Washington. Custis devoted his life to the memory of Washington and, among other things, painted impressive and ambitious battle scenes like this one in the dining room. At first, Custis said no to his daughter's marriage to Robert E. Lee, who is only a second lieutenant, who was without other means of support for his aristocratic daughter, Marianne. But finally, the young couple's wishes prevailed, and Arlington, for the most part, became their home. Marianne was as tardy as Lee was punctual, as careless about her dress as Robert was meticulous. She was whimsical as he was logical. Nevertheless, this couple loved each other and were devoted in a way which is almost beyond comprehension in our own time. Strangely, like Lee's mother, Mary Ann Custis eventually became an arthritic invalid also and totally dependent on Robert to nurse and care for her. There is no record that he ever complained. With the children, with all children, Lee had a magnetic and tender rapport. In 1846, the United States declared war on Mexico and Lee demonstrated remarkable courage and ingenuity in battle after battle. Every technique of his later military mastery, Lee learned in Mexico. It's also where he first met Ulysses S. Grant. 
I'll be back to tell you about the ghastly but gallant war between North and South right after this announcement. In March 1861, when Abraham Lincoln took the oath of presidential office, the final nail was driven into the already seceded. A member of Lincoln's cabinet offered Robert E. Lee command of the Union Army. Lee's views have been clear for a long time. Now we're in the front entrance hallway of the Arlington House. He had already freed the slaves here at Arlington and had said, slavery is a moral and political evil. I wish for no other flag than the Star Spangled Banner. But on April 18th, Virginia voted to secede. Lee was stunned. He was forced to choose between loyalty to the nation, to the army, and to his conscience, or to the ancient and awesome pools of land and family. In the darkest hour of his soul, in the sleepless dark of after midnight, Lee came downstairs and announced to his wife in this hallway, Mary, the question is settled. He showed her the letter he had composed resigning his commission and began to weep. My husband cried tears of blood, Mary said. Two days later, he accepted the command of the Army of Northern Virginia. More than one scholar has spent a lifetime analyzing the bitter struggle of the next four years and of Lee's campaigns. It would be presumptuous of me to try it in the too little time I have here, but I'll tell you what I can. The North was a formidable giant, and the odds for Lee were absurdly long, but his strategy was sound. Keep the war going long enough to exhaust the patience of the North or until Europeans in need of cotton would recognize the Confederacy and come to her aid. Twice he invaded the North, and twice he failed. In the bloody standoff at Antietam, and in the Confederate hemorrhage of Gettysburg. In Virginia, though, he was unbeatable. Even Grant paid a terrible price. But elsewhere, the South was beaten and bled. Finally, Lee's line was untenable. The end, which he had seen from the beginning, had come at last. He put on his dress uniform and surrendered with grace at Appomattox. Defeat for the Confederacy was total, and its only victory was personal in Robert E. Lee's intellectual and military genius and his unassailable personal character. Robert E. Lee is buried in Lexington, Virginia, where he served after the war in the last five years of his life as president of Washington College, now called Washington and Lee. I have led the young men of the South in battle, he said. I have seen many of them die on the field. I shall devote my remaining energies to training young men to do their duty in life. How do you reconcile the human paradox of Robert E. Lee? How do you understand a man so apparently without vices who fought on the side of the slave owner, though he detested slavery? First, you must measure him according to his time and place. For Lee, duty, honor, and humility were not fly specks on the pages of a politician's speech, but rather tangible realities as necessary to life as oxygen. It never occurred to him a gentleman could choose against these things. Therefore, he had to choose Virginia. Being here in Virginia, you begin to understand that, and especially here, where it all began, in this place called Stratford Hall. American lifestyle. Stratford Hall and Robert E. Lee. Starring as your host, Mr. E.G. Marshall. Has been brought to you by the USF&G companies and 6,500 independent insurance agencies representing USF&G.